so I can see. Yeah, good. I can hear my computer fan on the stream, but I don't think there's a way to really get around it. Okay, so this is my monthly book club, which is around business books, and today we're talking about amusing ourselves to death with my friend Jordan Lawler. Uh, Jordan works, he, Jordan was actually the first person that ever knew about the channel, because I talked, besides my wife, I talked about it with Jordan at a Chipotle in Pittsburgh uh, in December or November of 2014. And uh, with the time we worked together, and I miss working together, but Jordan now has a really cool job working for uh, Mercedes in social media. And he's also the arbiter of two very popular uh, Instagram pages for nut shots and girls getting hurt. Does that sum yeah. you up pretty well? Yeah, that's, uh, that, that's quite the introduction. I was wondering if you were going to mention the last two uh, <laughs> Instagram channels. Well, admittedly, not my proudest endeavors. They uh, they do keep the people entertained, and, and I'm certainly amusing uh, the Instagram user to death. So yeah, it's <laughs> exactly. it kind of fun how it comes full circle. But um, yeah, I do remember uh, that lunch at Chipotle. They just offered the was it the Sofritas mm -hmm. as as an option, and uh, you were talking about starting this channel, uh, really talking about comparing mattresses, uh, where it was the first, uh, kind of the first subject that you, that you were going to discuss, talking about whether, or, and you were always an early adopter, so using having the Apple Watch and using the biometrics to really measure uh, your sleep, whether it was a Casper mattress, a Lisa, or a Purple, um, mm -hmm. and, I, and I thought that was fascinating, and there's definitely a market for that, and then you ended up finding your niche with... Uh, the direct to, to consumer kind of box retailers. So um, yeah, it's fun. Glad glad we're finally connecting again uh, and talking about this years later. Yeah. Well, and at the time, you and I were always talking about business books, and this was one. I'm pretty sure you were, had rec recommended it, and then uh, I grabbed it on Audible and I read it, and I think I finished it within like two days because I like couldn't put it down and. For a book that is from 1985 to be so relevant to what we're living in right now is the reason I wanted to revisit it today because now it's four years, almost four years later from when we talked about it and it's still so much of the themes still ring true in my head because even though I haven't read it since then, I can still remember passages and the themes from it which um, have shaped a lot of the way that I now use social media and the way that I have approached my channel. I don't know if it's had a similar impact on you. Yeah. I it's weird, as, as I read the book, and, and you mentioned you, you rolled through it in two days, uh, I've listened to it. I don't have the hardcover, uh, but I've listened to it on Audible a couple times, and it's it's a short book, but it's so dense. Um, and Neil, Neil Postman writes it, it's, the words he uses, it, I mean, I, I told you this too, I had to have a dictionary next to me to look up half the words in this book. It It is, uh, Neil's vocabulary is pretty impressive to the point where it's like borderline condescending, but um, it's, uh, yeah, I, I always get introspe uh, really introspective uh, when I read it because it's, despite being written in 1985, it, it still rings so true, and I think that Neil Postman would be uh, rolling in his grave. Uh, you know, he, he talked about how uh, television has really changed uh, how we absorb uh, and retain or don't retain information, and this was pre-social media, um, really pre-internet, pre-Instagram. I can't imagine what he would think now, but maybe he wouldn't really think too much differently. He'd just say condescendingly, I predicted this and I knew this. Yes, he would say that with uh, a lot larger uh, $20 words, but that's that's the thing is it is, it's very slim of a book. I, I only bought the hardcover as we were like preparing for this. It's very slim and it's a small book, and then this is like the modern... Um, look at that, my phone's going off, I'm using myself to death. Um, this is like the modern, you got the TV guys here, but it's written with an introduction by Andrew Postman, which is his son, and he basically says that, which is, you know, he, he taught and all the students that were under him uh, never heard of Neil Postman, but then you get into this and you see just how relevant of a book that it is today. It's, it's a nice introduction that talks about how, you know, his father really saw the future but then it has some updated references in here. Um, actually, the the introduction was written in 2006, so it references PlayStation and Game Boys. 
It references it references the the Daily Show and CNN's Crossfire, and so it it, it basically puts into context the book that you are about to read uh, was written by my father, and it's just as relevant today as it was before. Which is, and it, you know it's got the nice modern thing. The the way that I remember it, because even the Audible one, they updated the Audible artwork since we read it. It used to be remember it was like people with fi- it was like they're around a fireplace. Uh, a very very primitive looking book cover. Yeah, and now it's got this guy with a TV for a head. And uh, the modern version of that would just be two hands as like smartphones, because that's really uh, where we're at. And, go ahead. I, I was going to say, I love, it, this is almost a kind of a living, breathing document that he really um, goes through the chronological, uh, in a chronological order, starting kind of with how information was shared, going back to um, oral history, written history, television, that it doesn't stop there. Um, I, there's somebody I, uh, who could certainly pick this book up and write uh, and just continue writing uh, the remaining chapters of it. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure it will always continue to change, but it doesn't uh, change the fact or void anything that, that he said in the book. It's it's still right today. Yeah, um, I so always well, think... He did, did write that, uh, write the introduction a modern introduction to it, I think there are a few chapters that could still be added on to the end. Yeah, it's true. I always think, I always try to put it into like the context though of the people that said when the printing press came out that that was going to ruin literacy. Uh, Because there's always those people, right, that the newer technology is going to destroy the old world and then people move forward. And so I think there is like a balancing act of it, but it's a healthy dose of, of reality and perspective to have this like ringing, ringing over on the side to say, you know, just understand what you're doing here. Yep. Oh, hundred percent. And like I said, I get really introspective when I, when I read this and I'm thinking like, man, like I'm really, I need to change the way that you know, I, I need to stop spending so much time on my phone. I mean, I'm honestly on my phone 12 hours a day. Like I need to donate a grain of science uh, when I go because there's, there's something going on upstairs, and I acknowledge it. Uh, I almost wish I were ignorant to it. But, um, but what Neil Postman says is it's not not the junk or the shit that's on TV and Instagram that's the problem. It's, it's when you confuse that entertainment and that junk as important information and news. Um, so as long as you can separate the two and using – uh, nut shots and girls getting hurt as a prime example. I by no means try to pass that off as news. So everybody, everybody needs some mindless entertainment. Uh, what's dangerous is when that mindless entertainment is passed off as uh, a credible news source, which I think you you would really be on any major cable network these days. Yes, and that's so. We'll, I like. I think we're still on the high level takeaway thing, but the the, the way that I always um, think about when I even when I see actual news. I have now, since reading this book, gone in and said, like, okay, I see this thing is happening. How is it directly impacting my life, and how much should I be paying attention to it? Because there was a period about 18 months ago where I was on my phone constantly. I follow a lot of people on Twitter, and I would I would make it a point to make sure I read every single tweet to that. Like, I would catch myself up, and then I would have, like, feelings one way or another, angry or happy, and I would just go through all this, like, emotional turmoil while reading Twitter, and then I would go away and be like, what did I retain from Twitter? And so that's, in a way, that when I talk about the, the themes that have resonated since then, me cutting myself out of Twitter almost entirely to then focus on things that are going on outside of life is is a direct result of focusing on this, because, um, and especially after 2016, and then you've got of uh, conservatives that are upset about everything. You've got uh, the left that's absurd, uh, upset about everything, and it's just like, what are what is everybody else being upset about things affecting my life directly, and how can I just wash it away and focus on what I'm trying to accomplish? Yeah, and if you think about it, there, I mean, with all of the news and that, and that's what he talks about. Like it, it's widened our ability to to take in information and knowledge, which is great, but there's almost too much and you have to sift through it. So with everything you have to sift through, what's true and, and, and what's not. And that's, uh, it's interesting that you'd say you'd kind of go down the rabbit hole of researching things on Twitter and reading about it, which I would argue is actually kind of a good thing because most people would just take the, the singular tweet, the 140 characters at face value 
and not actually do the research to, to learn more about it. And if you think about it, what with all of that information that's going on and everything that's happening in the world, like how much of it does have a direct effect on your life? Um, mm. At the end of the day, it's, it's really not a lot, but does that mean you shouldn't pay attention to it? Um, I think right now the, I mean, you could take anything going on over in the, in the European Union, in the EU, or um, the war on, on Iraq. And on it, you know, from a day, looking at it day to day, it really doesn't affect my life, but I, that doesn't mean I shouldn't pay attention to it. And that's the one, uh, I mean, there are a few things that I disagreed with Neil Postman on uh, reading this, but I mean, that was the one thing that just because something doesn't directly affect my day to day doesn't mean that I shouldn't at least be aware of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's the it is though some of the especially now in in the internet the the little details that people get upset about like looking at the war in Iraq as a whole yes you got to understand that but if you if you're like upset about one specific thing that has happened at a moment in time and everybody's upset about that uh, that's where I found myself like getting worked up and then not worrying about it later yeah big picture big picture right I also think of like the modern he's not the modern Daniel Postman necessarily but he's doing some of the things that Neil Postman talks about in this book, but I think that might be the reason I like Scott Galloway so much, because Scott Galloway right now is an NYU professor, but he's the one like banging the drum saying, we got to break up big tech, they're destroying a lot of social norms in our lives, they're letting Russia come into the US through this back door and this platform they created and they're extracting value and data from all these people, and so he now, Scott Galloway is really like the provocateur of today, and he's on major news stations and he's writing books and everything. I don't know how prevalent Neil Postman was in the 80s, like if he had a, a big presence because he was basically like crapping all over the, the institutions that would have promoted him. But Scott Galloway is taking some of that idea from before and he's using current mediums like YouTube and television and, and uh, Twitter to then really move his narrative forward. And so I think that, I think, I don't know if, that's why I like Scott Galloway so much. I think he's just a, a, an interesting guy, but um, that's that's how I think of it that now. Yeah, I've got to be honest. I don't know who Scott Galloway is. Oh, he was in my previous uh, book club. He did. He wrote the Four, which is a book about. Oh, oh, sorry. Yes, you're right. Yeah. yeah. So he did um, Apple, Google, Facebook, Amazon, and the DNA that is between them. And he does some. He, I mean, he goes into the reasons that regulations have encouraged these big tech companies to come out. And so he's the one now that's saying like, Amazon isn't a tr isn't uh, a monopoly by traditional standards, but they are a monopolistic entity. We just don't know how to regulate them because they're an entirely new thing. It's, it's kind of like Standard Oil back in the 1800s. It's like at the time they didn't look like a monopoly, but now we have precedents based on that monopoly that help break up new companies. And that's something that you, you've taken a particular interest in, in affecting your everyday life? Yes. Scott Galloway. I, I end up no, watching, I, he's one of the people that I end up watching like all of his YouTube videos because he is, he's very timely, but then I also get a lot of ideas for like the channel and other things there. Uh, it's basically him and Casey Neistat are my two like daily consumptions. <laughs> yeah, I I definitely uh, see where he's coming from with, with how these conglomerates and big tech are affecting society and changing social norms. Maybe I'm just fatigued from it all, but I've kind of just accepted that social norms are changing and things are changing. There are pros and cons to, to just about everything. Um, this uh, It could be an entire entirely separate conversation, but um, just looking at technology and, and how our phones have made us kind of, as individuals in a sense, uh, uneducated, uninformed individuals, uh, as Neil talks about, but at the same time, a lot of this entertainment, uh, while we're not being informed, I think it brings a lot of people together and a lot helps you know small groups and people really find each other and connect. So, um, pros and cons to each. We may be getting dumber, but um, you know it's it does bring people together at the same time. So it brings well, it brings us together, but it's, it separates us because like I see this, I see it more when I go to cities. How many people? on subways and streets and restaurants are on their phones while they're at each other. And I think that's the that's the way I find myself being very much a curmudgeon is like if I'm with somebody and I see them pull out their phone, I, there's one guy in particular I think of from work that uh, he is, he's constantly on his phone and 
I know it's not his intention to send a signal of disrespect or that he is uninterested in what I'm talking about, but that is how I take it because that's how it is talked about in the context. It's like if somebody pulls out their phone, they're, they are signaling that the thing they are doing on the phone is more interesting. And I know he's like on Twitter and Instagram, he's not, he's not even that always messaging other people. But when I see that at, when I see that at restaurants and I see a family together and they all have their phones out, like that's where I find myself being a Neil Postman, like this society is really falling apart and oh, this is so terrible. And so I am now very conscious, either when I'm out somewhere, I'm with somebody, like the phone is in the pocket, I try to silence it as much as I can and not pay attention to it because I don't want to send that signal, but I also um, am, and an old guy like that. True. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, now people use their phones as, um, let's say, uh, not a distraction, but if they really need it to, to be comfortable or if they're around a, a group of people who they don't know, they pull their phones out. In the past, what was I mean the phone the phone's kind of just the medium for them to divert their attention from feeling awkward in a group of people. What was that medium twenty five years ago? That same anxiety and feeling still existed. Mm -hmm. I would I would assume so. Um, did, did you pull out a magazine? Did, did you pull out a newspaper? Uh, I'm sure it's. That's a good point. Yeah. I'm just trying to back that up to my phone twenty four seven. I think it might have just been that people were quieter and more anxious internally. They just didn't have a, an outlet for it. But um, I don't really know. I think I used to like I would just play with shit around me. I would like play with at restaurants I'd play with forks and knives and I'd like crawl under the table. But I don't know what the adult version of that was. Yeah, right. Exactly. Uh, um, but it's uh, I'd like to think that Neil would have an iPhone. You think? Today. I think he'd yeah, be the guy right now that would have a flip phone. See, I've been thinking about, I've really been thinking about doing that, and I want to say in 2017, flip phones saw a 100% increase in sales, uh, where people now are starting to acknowledge how often they're on their phone and how often they're really amusing themselves to death, and um, it's nice that the awareness is there, uh, but I've really thought about taking my SIM card and putting it in my flip phone uh, for times when I don't need don't need my iPhone, uh, my one my one friend Ariel, she has uh, what she calls her festival phone. So whenever we would go to music festivals, she would take her SIM card out and put it in an old uh, razor. And for her, it was she she was able to text if she needed people, able to call, but it really allowed her to be present because the camera on that thing is so shitty that she's not going to be there at the concert holding her phone up the whole time. And I love the tweet. Uh, that I saw was uh, it was around the Fourth of July, and it was just somebody saying, "When was the last time you went back and watched all of those videos of the fireworks that you took?" And I'm like, "Man, that's gospel." Yeah, I came to that. I think when I had the razor, that's when I started taking a lot of pictures, and then I realized that they're terrible pictures. And I, I've struggled with that now. Like, there's two things as a parent that I really, really. I'm conscious of as I try to raise modern humans. And the phone thing is the first one. Like, They get about 10 minutes a day in front of any screen. We don't have TVs in the house, but they get 10 minutes a day where like we'll watch a movie before bed and it's something, it's like an old movie. It's usually like Snow White or Dumbo or um, watch a lot of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. And I'm very conscious not to put any screens in front of them. And they don't really ask for it, which is nice. But then... Um, also, not taking pictures everywhere I go. So, like, I, I travel, we both travel a lot for work, but I'm not, I don't take pictures of, like, buildings or cities or streets or things because, to me, it's like, I could Google a picture of New York and get a great picture. I don't need to take all these photos. And so, I don't take as many photos, I think, as I would have several years ago without that realization where I'd just be, like, snapping every picture of my kids. And part of that is... Like if we're having a cool moment on the 4th of July and we're watching fireworks, I don't want to think about, oh, I have to capture this because I'm living it in a way. And so that's always like my constant struggle is like, do I take the picture? Do I just enjoy it? Um, and so I've, because I've now conditioned myself, I don't always think, oh, I need to take a picture, but I watch other parents do it a lot. It's liberating when you can get to that point. Yeah. And I have, and I'll tell you that uh, I almost went full time on a Nokia candy bar phone, but the only thing that's keeping me there is Waze. Oh, that's a good point. Like, but. there's there's no real phone I can find. The, the main thing I need is, like, it'd be nice to play my podcast, but that's amusing myself to death. 
but I really need some way to navigate because I did think about going full time to a flip phone or a, just like some basic phone. But for me, I use my GPS so much that uh, that's what really helped me back. You don't have uh, navigation in your i3? I do have navigation in my i3, and it'll also be in my new Mini when it gets here. Actually, I got a call. It's here today I have to go pick it up soon. Awesome. Does, uh, just because I, I do work in the automotive industry, curious, I know you really do like your, your i3, and you had a vintage BMW before that, mm -hmm. right? I had a vintage Mercedes. That's right. Your dad had, was it an S-Class? Well, no, my dad still, my dad had the S-Class. He had an S600, uh, and then he went to an S550, but I had a, a 93 uh, 300D, so a diesel. It was an old tank, and I missed that car every single day. Did your i3 have Apple CarPlay? And as an Apple fanatic, did you use it? Uh, my i3 does not. The mo I think they're putting them in the newer models, but it has connected drive, which has a really good Bluetooth integration, and I, I found that to be more desirable than CarPlay because CarPlay, when it's connected, takes over the phone and it takes over the screen. So like anything you're doing on either one, you can't, like they, they mirror each other. So if you're in Spotify on the phone, Spotify tries to pull up on the screen, or but if you go to Waze, since Waze isn't supported by CarPlay, the CarPlay screen just goes blank and doesn't show anything. So you have to use Apple Maps. So I found it to be frustrating for that because all my rental cars typically have CarPlay now. But um, I didn't f make that a requirement in my new car either because I was so I was so unimpressed with it. But now that they're opening up CarPlay to third-party mapping systems, all I need in my in my life is like Waze and like Spotify. It's Waze, Spotify, it's Overcast. Insane. It's like those are the three things I need when I'm driving. Unfortunately, getting in Atlanta traffic all the time, the three things I need when I'm driving are Waze, Spotify, and Instagram. Uh, I spend a lot of time going zero miles per hour. But yeah, that's that's why I ask, because I have uh, I have Apple CarPlay in my car, but I, I don't use it. I just don't find uh, the user experience to be friendly. Yeah, I agree. Well, that's a, that's a nice tangent, but I have a passage that I, a couple of them that I wanted to go through and uh, just chat about those and see if you had any other, go through some of your passages too. Um, my favorite, and it's right in the beginning of the book, and it, it stuck with, this is one that I really like more than any of the others uh, going through them, is Neil Postman talks about how the metaphor of the nation sat in certain cities for a while, and it's representative of the entire nation's um, aspirations. And he says, you know, it started out in Boston, you had the Minutemen, which you being a Boston guy, always thought of you as well. Um, and then it moved to New York, because at the time, you know, the nation was bringing in immigrants, and they were spreading across the, the country, and New York was a big one. And then it moved to Chicago, and Chicago was really representative of the industrialization of America and the Windy City. And then he says, so in 1985, he says, today we must look to the city, and this is how dense the book is if you, uh, if you didn't read it. Today we must look to the city of Las Vegas, Nevada as a metaphor of our national character and aspiration. It's a symbol of a 30-foot high cardboard picture of a slot machine and a chorus girl. For Las Vegas, the city... Oops, uh, for Las Vegas is a city entirely devoted to the idea of entertainment and such proclaims the spirit of a culture in which all public discourse increasingly takes form of entertainment. Our politics, religion, news, athletics, education, commerce have been transformed into congenial adjuncts of show business, largely without protest or even much popular notice. The result is that we are a people on the verge of amusing ourselves to death. And... I like I like that I like I think the idea is spot on. Like at certain points in time, you really thought of certain cities to represent the entire U.S. And I think now we're at the tail end of where San Francisco and Silicon Valley has been. That like when the world thinks about the U.S., I think they think of New York or, or Washington D.C. They, but for the longest time, they were thinking of Silicon Valley because that's where all the really cool companies were out of the technology companies. Apple, you had the technology boom and bust at that time, and then. You have the startup culture of the early 2000s, but it seems like now that is starting to wane, par partially due to Scott Galloway, and we might be moving to a more like East Coast, Washington, D.C. era of this, but then a lot of indicators also go to the fact that it's being dispersed amongst all these smaller cities like Milwaukee or Pittsburgh or 
Um, even Atlanta being a huge hub for film and, and that, you know, even the Atlanta football club, that sort of thing. So we're in a period now where it seems like any city could capture that imagination of being like the American spirit. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, as you were reading that passage, I was trying to think, you know, what city would be next? And you mentioned San Francisco because it is, it is that tech hub. Uh, but I think that tech hub is representative of people like you and I who are interested in technology, early adopters, um, young millennials. But Las Vegas really is that city that's representative of America because you go there and you see gay, straight, black, white, old, East Coast, West Coast, Central. It is such a melting pot of people all there for essentially one purpose, and that's to be entertained. Um, but it is, um, I, I do think that, like Neil Postman said, is kind of representative of culture in America. Uh, but your point, there are, you see less and less, um, I would say cities almost being hubs, and now people are starting to disperse. Um, almost like people stop at, an analogy would be you see less and less people drinking Bud Lights and everyone going to craft beers and everyone has their choice of craft beers. It's like these, these smaller cities are now these craft beers that people uh, are kind of gravitating to. You, you mentioned Milwaukee, Pittsburgh. Uh, I hear more and more people saying, oh, if I'm going to go West Coast, I'm going to go to San Diego. I'm not going to go to L.A. Uh, so it's just kind of interesting that – and it's the same um, – I mean, talking about like the dispersing information, you, people don't have to be as centralized anymore. Transportation allows people to move around. Um, you can kind of be in one place and be everywhere at the same time. So do you really have to be in New York City if you don't want to be? Well, part of that is a function of the technology companies because like in Pittsburgh specifically, Google is paying engineers the, the, their San Francisco salaries but in Pittsburgh and that's causing like some rifts within here because you've got very well paid engineers that would never make that sort of salary if they worked at a local tech company. but because you've got Google and Apple and Facebook with hubs in Pittsburgh, you now have like centers of wealth around. Like East Liberty was just booming as you left, and it's now like they've got very, very big high-rise luxury apartments that nobody previously living there can afford. But it's the new people that are coming in from the technology companies, and um, I think I think that's just as fascinating too because I know it's happening in, in other cities. Yeah. Um, so Google does. Uh, do you notice that they have a, a much larger presence in Pittsburgh? Because when I was living there, I, I mean, I was young. I was probably oblivious to it, just content living in the south side. Didn't venture out too much. But uh, you, you did hear that Google had an office there. And I know that Pittsburgh's kind of at the forefront uh, with the autonomous driving, allowing Uber, might have been Uber Google, um, to have their cars uh, drive around un, unmanned. Um, but, yeah, do you find that Google has a much larger presence now? I don't sense the presence as much as I know that it's there, and so like I'll see signals of it or I'll hear anecdotes like that. Um, but I don't participate as much in the world where I think they would be more prevalent. I just know they've got an office, they got a lot of people, um, and actually Uber is laying off a lot of people from that self-driving uh, hub. I had a few friends that were either engineers in that system or they were like the monitors for the self-driving cars, and they're starting to lay that off. The new CEO seems to be divesting from uh, some of that initiative. Totally. What, um, so what's the next passage you got? Do you have one? Uh, so I'm scrolling through my notes here. We already touched on um, the one that I found really interesting in both oral and typographic cultures. Information drives its importance from the possibilities of action. So we already really talked about the news um, and how a lot of it doesn't really dictate our day to day. Uh, but I'd, like I said, I'd still argue that it is, it is incredibly important. Um, let me see what I have here. The phrase, so I'll start, it's on the short, the short sentence, now this. Oh, on yes. That There's, yeah, that's like a whole so, chapter, right? Yes. The phrase, if that's what it meant, if that's what it may be called, adds to our grammar a new part of speech, a conjunction that does not connect anything to anything, but does the opposite, separates everything from everything. 
As such, it serves as a compact metaphor for the discontinuities and so much that pass for public discourse in present-day America. There's no murder so brutal, no earthquake so devastating, no political blunders so costly, for that matter, no ball scores. Uh, you can tell Neil Postman's not, not a sports guy. <laughs> yeah. No ball score so tantalizing or weather report so threatening that it cannot be erased from our minds by a newscaster saying, now this. So uh, there were some statistics in the book that the average, uh, the average scene on television lasts three seconds and the average news second lasts 45. So they're always trying to keep us entertained to move from one sort of superficial thing to the next instead of really um, investing and educating us on one particular topic. Uh, but the news is so fragmented. Uh, you're covering everything from, uh, I mean, they, they use some some pretty intense examples in, in murders, in earthquakes, political blunders. You jump from, I mean, the, none of those are connected, but in one 30-minute news segment, they'll jump from subject to subject to subject, separated by now this. And there is another statistic that I read that within an hour after watching a local news segment, 51% of people couldn't recall or, uh, or discuss one thing that they saw. So it's so ephemeral. It's, it's in one ear, out the other. Um, but I found this passage so fascinating because uh, do you watch Last Week Tonight with John Oliver? Every week. He has that. He has the, in the middle of a show. And now exactly this. Talking so, yep. And now this. And you're like, you have my attention. Uh, I heard that there's the one, if you could start a speech or, or anything, the one introductory sentence that captivates people's attention, other than now this, is um, once upon a time. Mm -hmm. If you start anything with once upon a time, uh, that, that's the one line that really grabs people's attention. Uh, but it's just funny how, how something like that and, and how now this can uh, either grab your attention or make you forget uh, about whatever it was that you were talking about before. I have a best man speech coming up in three weeks. I'm going to open with Once Upon a Time. Yeah, there you go. No, I think I remember that passage very distinctly because at the time, it was right when John Oliver had started, and I really appreciated that John Oliver takes 20 minutes sometimes to get really deep into one topic. And I think that that opportunity, it's now more than ever with YouTube to really go into something, and that's like what I try to do on my channel too, is like, here's a topic. Instead of giving you a 30-second soundbite, here's a little bit more detail behind it. And if you're curious, you can you know, follow these sources in order to get in there. And that's what I was always – it was always really frustrating in, in school because teachers were always very quick to put off Wikipedia. But it's like if you use Wikipedia for what it's for, it's a great summary of a lot of information. But then you go to all those sources and you've got so much rich information that other people have cultivated. Um, you know, I, I don't know where Neil Poston would stand on Wikipedia, but I'm sure he'd, he'd be uh, – He'd be really sick of the Instagram stories. I think you'd hate that. Totally. Um, and I get frustrated. Admittedly, I don't watch the news at all. I watch Vice, well, it's millennial of me saying that. I watch Vice News tonight, <laughs> yeah. every day I get home. That's my news source. Occasionally check CNN. Uh, but that's, that's really it. And I get frustrated. Is it, it's chicken or the egg? Is it the news that isn't giving us the information or is it us as a culture that doesn't want to absorb detailed information? Uh, I mean, it's a little bit of both. I'm sure one perpetuates the other, but also talking uh, to connect this back to how um, the this, this sprawl that, that's going on in America and you, this enormous country um, with such a diverse group of people and you have a national you have these national news channels, uh, you can't possibly deliver news that's relevant to everybody. Um, and Neil talks about that with the telegram and especially the television. Uh, it's no longer, you know, if you watch the national news, they can't talk about what's really important and what's going to affect your day-to-day your -day life because what's going to affect your life and the people in your small town is totally irrelevant to someone on the opposite side of the country. So... Then it got me thinking even further. It's like, all right, I got to stop. Uh, even, like I said, don't really watch 
cable network news, but I got to stop the people from watching cable network news. It's it's terrible. It's terrible. But what's the alternative? Do I tell them to watch the local news station? That is that is like I realize that I run an Instagram account that's people videos of people getting hit in the nuts, but that is just vile television. It's horrible. Well, and, and an interesting anecdote to that is, so when I ran, I did the marathon in the suit, and I did a YouTube video on it, and like some of my friends saw it, but I got picked up by the local news, and they did a segment on me, and the only people that saw that segment were like 50 years and above. So there really is a split on people that ever watch it. So like I went to, it, it was like a couple weeks after that was on the news, I went to a family event, and like all these people came out like, oh, I saw you in the news, and then as I was thinking about it, it's like all my aunts and uncles that are... 50 plus and nobody my age really saw it unless they were shared the uh, the YouTube video on Facebook yeah. or Instagram and so it is true and I think about that too because there was a, there's a site for a while called patch and patch was all about these like small communities and it had like reporters and it was it was really about trying to cultivate that they shut down and then like every city used to have three or four newspapers all of those are shutting down so there really isn't an alternative I'm sure in Atlanta like in Pittsburgh we get the Pittsburgh Post Gazette and a couple others but there really isn't any good local reporting anymore and um, that's that's its own industry that's kind of sad that it's going away as everybody moves to having larger numbers and national attention there's really not a lot of focus on small things but I hope that that's something we'll see now with publishing tools being so available um, there's a couple of ones in Pittsburgh that I found, like the Incline or a few others where it's like just a couple of group of people that want to cover things. But um, like if I want news for where I live in Whitehall, which is a suburb of Pittsburgh, it's few and far between. Yeah, I mean, I can commend you for doing that research. Like I said before, you see a tweet and you dig into it to really to really get your facts. Whereas I'm at the point now where I just don't, I don't have the time to do that. Yeah, uh, it's It's almost like, reading book and again Neil talks about reading and and typographic information takes discipline and you have to sit down and you have to commit to to absorbing that information and, and reading and and kind of contextualizing things and extrapolating thoughts and you have to think whereas uh, with with visual information you really don't it's uh, and I just don't, I don't have, I'm always on the go. Um, I, I don't have time to sit down and read like I used to. So I try to, I try to absorb information, whether it's through podcasts um, or listening to the news in the background. But again, like I'm not committed to, even when I'm listening to a podcast, I'm still driving. I'm usually thinking about something else. If I have the news, uh, vice news on and I'm cooking, you know, I still don't retain half the things I take in. So, yeah. Well, even you for, this is this was the book in June. Doing that. I wish I were. Well, yeah. So this is our book for June. I bought this like at the end of the month to try and get it, and like I didn't even make the time to sit down and really flesh out my thoughts on this because I feel that everybody feels the same way that you're always moving, you're always on, the, and you can't really pay attention. And I'm just as guilty of listening to like 40 hours of podcasts a week, and I listen to them at 2x speed, and I can't tell you how much I really retain of it. But what I've started to think about there is I use that more as like a springboard for ideas. Like I, I may only retain 25% of what I think about, but that helps me, it helps bring me inspiration to jump down another like rabbit hole of thought and inspire me to go do something. And so, um, and I usually, if, I have really, I have a bad, I have bad recall, but I have good memory. So if I get something to like trigger a, a memory, I can pull, I can like pull that back in. But I can't just sit here and think like, what was a podcast I listened to a few weeks ago about this topic? But if somebody's talking about something, I can usually like pull in what I listened to before. Uh, and so I'm always trying to figure out how to like really leverage that. And even if, uh, let's say you sit down and read a book and that takes five hours of your time and you retain 100% of that information, um, that's fantastic. I don't have that five hours. But if I'm constantly on the go and over 25 hours, I absorb 20% of that information. Am I netting equal equal information retention? Who knows? Numbers game. Yeah. And the, the other one that I really liked, and it was on the, the topic of television, is he makes the analogy to television priests. And he says, you know, nobody jokes with themselves, or nobody kids themselves that the 
uh, sympathies of a card are equal to a physical presence when you're whispering in their ear, but we take television priests, he, this, that chapter he was like, he was really digging into them there, but we take these like television priests as speaking to the masses and all, and you know, it, that being a equal equivalence to attending a mass or a service and, and being around that community in person. And uh, that one is another one that always stuck with me as like we're moving from, um, and I think of this too in the context of I still live in an area where a lot of the people I went to grade school and high school with are in this area. And if my family runs into somebody that recognizes, like you recognize people, like, oh, hey, tell, tell John I said hi. It's like, just message me on Facebook if you wanted to say hi. It's like, we're all connected. Like, why? Like, if, if you see my aunt and you say, tell him I said hi, it's like, why don't you just get on your phone right, literally right there. You still have my phone number and just say, hey, what's up? Ran into your aunt. How are you doing? It's like, like, that's such a weird thing. We're in this, we're in this period where we have norms that were established by not having technology, but we're so ingrained in it already. And like, especially you and I at our age, we're, we're still in, we're in that period where we grew up mostly with it, but there's a whole generation that grew up only knowing that thing. And so we still have some of the traditional stuff from our families and our upbringings, but we're in a world where everything's connected. It's, I, I just, I always chuckle with that kind of thing. Yeah, it's, um, it's a pretty interesting kind of juxtaposition or even contradiction. It is nice when someone says, hey, I ran into so-and-so, they said hi, you're like, that's nice. But if they were to just slide into your DMs and say, hey, you're like immediately a little taken back and defensive. Like, mm -hmm. hey, what you thinking about? <laughs> yeah, but if somebody well, runs yeah. into somebody you know, you'd be like, hey, ran into your aunt, how you doing? That's That's true. That's the modern way to do it. But yeah, sliding, if I was like, if I was thinking about like a girl I knew in high school and I was just like, what's up? She'd be like, what the hell? Aren't you married with two kids? Oh, you're the YouTube guy. Yeah. Um, I'm looking for a couple of my notes on which section of the book was that on the religious, uh, the chapter was something Bethlehem. But anyways, uh, I don't even want to get started on televangelists. Like, these people <laughs> drive me absolutely insane. And the traffic that they, mega churches cause in Atlanta, it's, it's not okay. <laughs> uh, but it, um, I did have a passage written down from that, I'm looking for it. We'll do that one, and then we'll do our, our closing thoughts. Oh, yeah. It's, it says, on these shows, so, um, God, like, Joel Austin's face immediately comes to mind. Uh, the preacher is tops. God comes out as second banana. Um, <laughs> and it, it made me chuckle a little bit, but it, that that's, a, that's kind of a recurring theme that we become such a visual... Um, a visual society that it's not what's said that's necessarily important it's how it looks and and how it's delivered and these just like the news these these preachers and these mega churches are uh, they're really there to, to entertain and um, they're having to you know jump from subject to subject instead of spending you know I think I, I grew up going to Catholic school and I remember like the average homily time uh, when the priest would really give his unstructured unstru thoughts on, on a lesson sometimes would go 15, 20 minutes. And I had a pretty short attention span as a kid. It's significantly shorter now. But I I mean, the average homily time has got to be sub five minutes now. Mm -hmm. um, so it really is, uh, I mean, it's all about being quick, uh, quick and entertaining. Uh, Neil Postman calls us great abbreviators. It's essentially all it's what we all are. Yeah. Although, could be having a renaissance. I find that if I have a two-hour podcast of people talking about a, of topics, like, I'll gravitate to that quicker than, like, the, I have a 90, it's a 90-second, like, daily brief podcast I listen to. And so, um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe we're coming around the curve. We were at, a, we were at an, in an area where there was such fast information all the time that now, we might be swinging up to the other side of appreciating when things can move a little bit slower. So maybe yeah, I need to slow down my my cadence and my videos because I've I know I've sped up a lot since my early videos. 
and that's just I mean the world's always changing uh, when the written language came about I'm sure orators uh, were like oh shit job security or uh, when the printing press came out uh, and pamphlets started to be uh, the source of information versus newspapers and then you had radio and then television and now you have the internet um, it to me it's all that's just life things change you got to adapt to it uh, who's to say that one thing's better than the other so try to look at the pros and cons but um, it is again for given that this is a book review for anybody that hasn't read this book yet um, I would definitely recommend uh, get, sitting down and spending it we'll probably get through it in about four hours uh, but it will really give you um, a really interesting perspective on on our news uh, or in mediums by which we absorb information and uh, you know for better or worse but the fact that it was written in 1985 it's it's fascinating it's like you know postman was looking into a crystal ball but I think it's also helpful from a from a content consumers perspective or someone like us that are on the forefront of being in that space so like you've got huge social media reach and followings both with what your side thing is with uh, your Instagram accounts, but also as you're setting up strategy for social media through Mercedes, and so like for myself with my YouTube channel, it's like either whether you're creating the stuff or if you're consuming it, being aware of how these things progress, I think is is valuable. So I think it's good for everybody. Yeah, and it's it it, it really is fascinating, especially in the advertising space. Uh, you know, we we know that we have only a certain amount of time to retain uh, people's attention. You have to grasp their attention within the first three seconds, uh, they, they say. And we really, uh, we now experiment with having six-second ads. So we, um, we'll we take some TV commercials. Uh, so let's say it's a 30-second spot. Uh, we'll condense that and optimize it for uh, your feed and Facebook. Instead of having um, the full script read out, we might add a couple supers in there uh, and really get that information across in six seconds. And what's, what's interesting is there there is a way to absorb information quicker and still retain it because uh, we do brand studies with some of these um, these tests that we run uh, on Facebook and Instagram and uh, we're really able to tell by optimizing uh, a message for feed uh, we can get the same information across and have people retain it uh, you know within from just a six second ad it's, as better uh, than they would if they had watched a, a full 30 second spot so uh, maybe there is hope for us who, who quickly absorb superficial information you just got to absorb it the right way and it has to be delivered the right way in order to have some staying power that's true I think that's a great place to hold it so uh, strong recommend for both of us on Neil Postman yeah. amusing ourselves to death and uh, thanks for recommending it four years ago Jordan and uh, for jumping in this time yeah, man. Um, really excited to to be on the show. I'm a huge fan of the Cavalier ever since that day at Chipotle, and uh, it's been fun really watching it take off. So proud of you, man. Yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, and sorry to sorry to or for not knowing who Scott was. If Scott watches this, I apologize. Uh, I highly doubt Scott Galloway is watching this live stream or knows about my channel. But someday, okay. someday. stop yourself short. <laughs> Cool. Well, I'll talk to you uh, very soon, and I'll probably pick a new book maybe for September because i got a couple of ideas for what I want to do next. So thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you probably on Monday. i got some videos coming out.